Hi gang, long ago in the dim and distant pre-history of Warhammer 40k, there were the Men of Gold and the Men of Stone, the distant ancestors of mankind by whose efforts the galaxy was populated and conquered and whose artifice brought about the age of technology and the sentient robots known as the Men of Iron and whose civilization collapsed when they inevitably turned. So, who were these gold and stone men of 41st millennium myth? It's the sort of question that generates an awful lot of fan theories. So, in this video, I'm going to go back and look at what is actually written. So, the story of the men of gold, men of stone, and men of iron is one of those persistent bits of Warhammer lore that just pops up from time to time. The very simplified version of the story goes that long ago, way past the point of human record keeping, at least in the 41st millennium, there was a race of humanity known to the people of 40k as the Men of Gold, who were amazing, the pinnacle of humanity, and at some point in our future and 40k's distant past, the Golden Men sent out into the void Men of Stone, who were constructed or engineered or, or just really good at technology. And in turn, they made the Men of Iron, who we know as artificial intelligences, sentient robots. And then those Men of Iron went on to rebel, plunging the galaxy into war and leading to humanity's distrust of new technology and the outlawing of AI and all of that stuff helped plunge mankind into the Age of Strife, which lasted 5,000 years until the coming of the Emperor. That's the basic story, we'll look at it in detail later. The Men of Iron are mentioned a lot in 40k. They pop up occasionally as an ancient antagonist from the past. But the Men of Gold and Stone are an in-world mystery. Ancient history never fully explained. Just hinted at from various sources. And in Warhammer, that sort of thing leads to content. You can find a million theories and videos and explainers of the different material men and what it all really means. And as usual with LoreTube, the facts and the fan theories are often muddled together to create something that sounds a bit more solid than it actually is and to allow the creator to waffle on for an hour, and that can be confusing. There are actual mentions of this theory in published 40k works, and they're all from a very specific period in time. So in this video, we're going to go back to the original source material, read through every single bit of lore about the men of stone and gold, don't worry, that won't take long. Look at how that developed into the Men of Iron, who have a little bit more information, and then look at how modern 40k makes use of this ancient lore, if it really even does. So let's start way back at the beginning with the very first mention of this lost theory in the lore. The Journal of Keeper Kripias is a page of in-world text from the back of the Warhammer 40k 3rd edition rulebook, published in 1998. In Warhammer 40k, the past is often a mystery. The people of the 41st millennium are only dimly, vaguely aware of the events of prior millennia, particularly of any events prior to the coming of the Emperor. The ways in which humanity progressed to be capable of leaving Earth, the first human interstellar empires, the development of the powerful technologies the Imperium still makes use of, all of these are basically lost to time in much the same way as we have no idea what happened prior to about 5,000 years ago. The five millennia before the Emperor's Great Crusade in M30 was known as the Age of Strife, when great warp storms caused humanity to fracture and devolve into thousands of competing independent civilizations, and this period acts as something of a barrier. So much knowledge was lost that the humans of the 41st millennium have very little idea of how things were before. It. The Journal of Keeper Kripias presents us with one Imperial Department's best attempt to reconstruct this, retold in the sort of tones usually reserved for mythology. Keeper Kripias is introduced, in fact introduces himself, as the Keeper of the Library Sanct 
Galactus on Terra, charged with a lifelong aim to compile a history of the human race, or at least as much as the Keepers can piece together at the end of the 41st millennium, and in this single page of text he lays out their best guess of how humanity evolved into a star-faring race. There's a bit of setup at the start, so I'll just read the relevant part, but technically I am just reading from a book, so I guess I'd better put on some background music. Okay, dramatic voice. And so it was that in the first age of man, the golden age, there is the emperor unseen and unheralded, he prepares the old earth for the coming of mankind and he watches and he waits. He is joined by the first men of the golden race, fine of limb and strong of mind, yet still the emperor is content to wait in shadow, to watch and learn from mankind. The golden race spreads across the face of old earth, multiplying and establishing order and civilization on the anarchy of nature. In time, the second men of the stone race appear, and in their wake come many miracles and marvels of technology that strengthen the stone men's power, but are also harnessed by those of the golden race. Although physically inferior to the golden race, and not of philosophical temperament and disposition, the stone men have in them the conjuration of great artifices and mechanisms. In time, the golden race looks to the stars to expand their dominion. The stone race builds great machines of power that send both men of stone and men of gold into the ether. However, once the burgeoning race of mankind has taken its first steps into the greater cosmos, the golden race dwindles in influence through their dependence on the artifices of the stone race. Thus the golden age comes to an end and the stone men prevail. Our calculations from the most distant and archaic records and through constellar comparison have dated the end of the golden age at 20,000 years previous to our present time. For the next 5,000 years, the stone race lives through the dark age of technology. Little can be determined from the dark age of technology for the majority of existing records concerning that period are gathered in the Librarius Omnis of Mars, and none outside the highest ranks of the Adeptus Mechanicus can gain access past its most determined guardians. Keeper Malrubius tried once, but to no avail. We have surmised that during the Dark Age of Technology, the Men of Stone create the Iron Men to help them in the building of their great empire. At first, the Iron Men are as servants, willing to do the bidding of their masters with no thoughts. However, the Iron Men, as all creatures do, evolve and grow until they are the equal of the stone race, and beside each other they set about conquering the galaxy. The Dark Age of Technology is an era of machines and artificial devices, used by the Stone Men and later the Iron Men in their endeavours. Many of the technical marvels that the Priesthood of Mars sustain can be traced to their origins in the Dark Age of Technology, and it is at the end of this period that the great organisation, now known as the Adeptus Mechanicus, was founded. During the Dark Age of Technology, the austere ancestors of the Imperium's Navis Nobilitae are born, and through their unique prowess, mankind forges through the stars. Weapons of great destruction cow the aggression of alien enemies, pushing back the frontiers of mankind's dominions. The end of the Dark Age of Technology is the most obscure region in mankind's evolutionary tale. For whatever reasons and differences in ideology, the Stone Men and the Iron Men fell to warring with each other. The Iron Men were possessed of no soul, an anathema to any true man. The Stone Men, in their final acts of self-preservation, annihilate the Iron Men who have turned from ally to foe, and even those of the Iron Race who retained their former loyalties to their one-time masters are destroyed in the fiery crucible of battle. Still, the Emperor, in his eternal wisdom, awaits the moment to reveal the true path to mankind destiny. 
Thus, the start of the Age of Strife is heralded. The Age of Strife sees the collapse of the ancient empire built by the stone men. Mankind is split asunder. There is no race of man, just warring factions competing with each other in the direst perils the galaxy could offer. Seeing humanity's weakness, alien dominance grows in power once again. The arms of the stone men left to ruin, the protection of the iron men destroyed in the last years of the dark age of technology. So that's the basic story, at least the first time it's published. The men of gold existed. In this version of the story, the emperor comes first and then the golden men, uh, and they're great. Then we get the stone men. They just appear in this and they're not as philosophical and more technological. And the stone race build technology that allows both sorts of humanity to travel to different stars. While both sorts of men work together, the stone men overtake the golden men in around the 20th millennium. Depending on which timeline you use, that would be potentially about halfway through the dark age of technology. And after that, we don't hear about the golden men. Then the stone men build the iron men, who we know are robots initially as servants, and with them the stone men and the iron men make humanity incredibly powerful, and then, as we know, we have the giant rebellion that leads to war and the collapse of humanity's interstellar civilization. This is the very first mention of all this, and I like how the position of the writer and his obvious bias and lack of knowledge is so present. For example, Kripias refers to the Emperor coming before the Golden Men. Now, we know from other sources that the Emperor was born around 6000 BCE, and humans have been around for millions of years, so we might assume that the Golden Race were some sort of special humans who appeared after the Emperor. But we don't know if Kripias knows that. Kripias comes from an age which worships the Emperor as God, so it would be totally reasonable for him to think the Emperor has just always been there, and thus the Golden Men could just mean regular humans. Or maybe they're ancient humans, and we're the Stone Men who make technology. It's deliberately mythological, far from definitive. Very Olaf Stapleton or Tolkien-esque, that the historians of the far future have so little knowledge that they have to assemble all this from really vague references that could kind of mean anything. But the next source we get is presented as being from the point of view of someone who, well, might have been a bit closer to it. Two years later, in 2000, Andy Chambers' Ancient History was published, a short story included in the Inferno magazine, and then republished in a few compilations over the years. In this, we follow Nathan, a press-ganged naval crewman, as he comes to terms with his new life as part of a gun crew on an ancient Imperial battleship, where he meets a grizzled old voidsman called Called Kron. Kron has been a lowly rating on this ship for what seems like ages, and knows all the tips and tricks and secret routes around, and sort of takes Nathan under his wing. But Kron is also much more than that. He has an augmetic eye, he seems to be able to heal really fast, and during a boarding action, he takes out a Chaos Space Marine with an energy blast. And crucially, when that eye is knocked loose for a second, it seems that the human underneath is terrified of it going back on, almost as if Kron is the eye, and when it's connected, the person underneath has no control anymore. Anyway, Kron tells Nathan another version of this story, though rather than a history text, it's presented like an old mariner's tale. Cue the music. Once long ago, man lived on just one island. The broad ocean surrounded him, and he believed himself alone. In time, man's stature grew, and he caught sight of other islands far off across the deep ocean. Since he'd seen everything on his island, climbed every peak, and looked under every stone, he became curious about the other islands and tried to reach them. He soon found the oceans too deep and cold for him to get far, not nearly a hundredth of the way to the next island. So man returned and put his hand to other things for an age. But in time, food and water and air ran short on man's island, and he looked to the far islands again. 
Because he could not bear the cold of the ocean deeps, he fashioned men of stone to go in his place, and the stone men fashioned men of steel to become their hands and eyes. And the stone men went forth with their servants and swam in the deep oceans. They found many strange things on the far islands, but none as strange or as wicked as the things that swam in the depths between them. Ancient, hungry things older than man himself. But these beasts of the deep hungered for the true life of man, not the half-life of stone, and so the stone men swam unmolested. At first all was well, and the men of stone planted man's seed on many islands, and in time man learned to travel the oceans himself, hiding in stone ships to keep out the cold and hunger of the beasts. All was well, and man spread to many islands far across the ocean, such that some even forgot how they came to be there, and that they ever came from just one island at all. Kron's tale wound on, telling of how the stone men became estranged from humanity by their journeys through the void. This led to a time of strife, when the men of steel turned against their stone masters and mankind was riven asunder by wars. A thousand worlds were scoured by the ancient terrible weapons of those days before the men of stone were overthrown, and a million more burned as flesh fought against steel. Worst of all, the beasts arose and were worshipped as gods by the survivors. Once proud and mighty, man was reduced to a rabble of groveling slaves. Finally, one came who freed man from his shackles and showed him a new way to reach the stars. This path was forged from neither stone nor steel, but simple faith. Faith guarded man from the beasts of the void, as steel or stone could never do. And with that, you have now read every single extant piece of information on the men of gold and the men of stone. Every one of these videos is derived from those two. The men of iron, or steel, if you're Kron, have a little bit more, but let's look at Kron's account first. Kron's story is very different in tone, but the basic plot is the same. He doesn't mention the men of gold at all. There are just men, later implied to be men of flesh, who then create the men of stone. Obviously, it's all couched in nautical terms, but it's clear that regular people couldn't do interstellar travel because they were at risk from the beasts of the deep who hungered for their true life, which is likely to mean warp demons hungering for their souls. So, they created stone men whose chief difference seems to be only having a half-life, which kept them safe from the warp, we think. This could be taken a number of ways. In 40k, heavily augmented people with lots of cybernetics have less prominent souls, as do clones, as do pariahs or blanks. They're sort of anti-souls, although they usually be described as some sort of horrible anathema to the warp rather than just half-lived, so it's probably not them. We know that genetic engineering was commonly employed in the Dark Age of Technology, because navigators came from the same period, but as psychers, they have even more of a soul. So stone in this story seems to be a stand-in for something less susceptible to the warp. And we can guess this because eventually the stone men make stone ships that were safe for non-stone men to travel in. We might assume that that is the Geller field, which keeps ships in 40k safe from the warp. That's stated elsewhere as being from the Dark Age of Technology. And then we move on to the revolt of the steel men, broadly the same as in Kripias. Interestingly, in this, the stone men, after becoming estranged from the rest of humanity, were the first target of the steel men, the men of iron, during their revolt. And only after the stone men were gone did they turn on to the flesh men. So, Crom tells broadly the same story as Kripias, with a few differences, and while it's never explicitly said, it's heavily implied that the thing that is Crom might be speaking from first-hand knowledge. Whatever the cybernetic parasite thing is, it's sort of implied he might have been there. Before we get on to how to interpret all of this, let's take a look at the Men of Iron. Unlike the other two, they've been a pretty consistent presence in Warhammer lore since then, though they're also not mentioned as often as you might think. The Men of Iron are sentient machines, true artificial intelligence, robots who can actually think. They pop up in 40k in a few different forms. Their first proper mention is, I think, Ghostmaker by Dan Abnett, the first Gaunt's Ghost book from 2000, which places it right at the same time 
time as the other two, in that the ghosts stumble on an STC constructor machine that manufactures men of iron, though it's been corrupted by chaos and it's destroyed at the end. They also pop up in Inferno again, in another short story involving the Adeptus Arbites, but we don't really learn anything new in either of these. They're just portrayed as mostly humanoid robots that can be built. Once the Horus Heresy series started a bit later in 2006, followed by the Heresy game books in 2012, we got a little more info, as, as you might expect given that the time period of the Horus Heresy is a lot closer to all this. For example, the Exindio Battle Automata are horrific machines made from neutered iron men, and while we don't get an explicit description, it's implied that these are sort of horrible balls of flailing tentacles rather than the humanoid robots of previous incarnations. And later, all person sent back in time in the short story Perpetual from 2016 describes the War of the Men of Iron, the cybernetic revolt, as featuring machines that feel a lot more matrixy and less humanoid. All remembered the horrors of entropic engines that ignited planets, sun snuffers that uncoiled like serpents the size of Saturn's rings, mechanivores ingesting data along with the cities that contained them, and hurling continents into the heavens, omniphage swarms stripping flesh from a billion bones in the blink of an eye. At the same time, other forms of sentient machine have popped up here and there in the setting. The Vansar of Necromunda have at least one semi-functioning STC that is described as being an AI. The Forge of Mars trilogy, starting in 2012, features a Dark Age ship called the Speranza, which is implied to be intelligent, though in a sort of old, slow way, a bit like the manifolds of Titans. And the Space Marine Battles novel Death of Integrity from 2013 features a ship called the Spirit of Eternity, which is a much more lucid character, an AI driven mad by its travels through the warp and its treatment by the Imperium. And then finally, the Blackstone Fortress character UR025 is confirmed to be a Man of Iron posing as a Mechanicus robot. And in his short story, also called Man of Iron, he feels very human, really. There's no confirmation anywhere of which of all these are and are not Men of Iron. We don't know if Men of Iron means any artificial robot intelligence, or if it's just the humanoid ones, and ships like the Speranza or the Spirit of Eternity are something different. The prime role of the Men of Iron, though, is as a warning. The Cybernetic Revolt was a war so huge it made the Horus Heresy seem small in comparison, only narrowly averted by an alliance of galactic empires, and in the wake, intelligent machines the Silica Animus, Abominable Intelligence, was outlawed across the Imperium, giving rise to the Mechanicum of Mars. Any future robots were required to have human brain tissue at their core and be programmed to follow set instructions. It's a story borrowed from a few other sci-fi franchises and then used to set up the world of 40k, which had already been written at the time. So. How do we square all this? Over the years, I've seen all sorts of theories online, though they're usually pretty much guesswork. Were the men of gold just humans, as Kron describes, or were they advanced humans, or humans that predate us, or even something recognisable from 40k, like perpetuals? We don't know. I've seen people describe the men of stone as us, or as cybernetically enhanced people, maybe like Kron himself, or even suggesting that ships like the Speranza were the men of stone, and and the men of iron were therefore their literal hands and eyes, as Kron describes. But the men of stone are meant to be half alive, with maybe half a soul? And that doesn't sound like any of the spaceships we've met. That sounds more like cybernetically enhanced people like the Mechanicus. But there is one other piece of information out of world to look at here. In a post in 2016, Laurie Goulding, a former editor at the Black Library, briefly describes chatting with Alan Merritt, the former head of IP, about this concept years later. And though this is filtered through a couple of people and years, it definitely sounds like Alan Merritt had a plan. From his lips, the Golden Men were a genetically engineered master race, with selective breeding, kinda like in Dune. Not the only thing stolen from Dune, Alan. The Iron Men were obviously machines, but the stone in stone men refers to silicon, as in they are organic intelligence, but created artificially. I like to think of them as the 13th tribe from Battlestar Galactica, which are the organic Cylons, which if you haven't seen it, are essentially like created beings, but in meat bodies. So that might have been Alan Merritt's intention at the time, 
but the time these original stories were published is quite important. All the original lore comes from one very specific time period, from around 1998 to 2000, around the launch of 3rd edition 40k. 3rd edition did quite a lot of work reimagining the 40k universe. In tone, it was a lot more grim dark than the bright colours of 2nd edition, and it marks the start of Games Workshop moving away from their previous fantasy-inspired lore and towards something bigger and more complicated and more unique. 40k had started out as a sci-fi port of Warhammer Fantasy with many of the same archetypes. Space elves, space orcs, that sort of thing. Third edition removed some of this, bye-bye space dwarfs, and introduced new factions. The Dark Eldar, the Necrons, the Tau, the ancient mythology of the War in Heaven, the Catan and the Old Ones were all introduced around then, giving 40k universe millions of years of extra prehistory, with a load of new unknowable terrors from the distant past. I'd guess that the men of gold, stone and iron was part of that redirecting of 40k. Another option to be picked up and run with if the studio wanted to. But, as it turned out, beyond a few short stories at that time, it was never really explored. It was just one of the ideas left on the table, occasionally picked up again in years to come. And so while 40k doesn't ever get rid of lore, all this stuff is still canon, none of this really tells us what this theory is considered to be in 40k today. After all, the only lore we have is in-world and from extremely unreliable narrators. The canon answer might be that all this happened, it's all true, or that it's just an inaccurate myth. The keepers of the library sanctus were wrong. That's very similar to how the old origins of the Dark Angels are treated. But there is one modern faction that have referenced the men of stone and gold in recent years, and that is the Leagues of Votan. The Leagues of Votan are a reimagining of the old squat faction, the original Space Dwarfs, introduced in 2022, and while their lore doesn't directly confirm any of this, it does slot really nicely alongside it. The kin of the Leagues are artificially made humans created by their ancestor machines, great AI STC constructs called Votan. They were originally created in the dark age of technology to mine the worlds of the galactic core, setting sail with their ancestor machines in great generation ships and traveling far from the birth world through the void. They could do this because the kin of the Leagues are clones, but not the bad sort. The Votan have a great repository of different genetic information and blend this in various ways to make individual kin. The kin have adapted over the millennia, usually being deliberately engineered to be short, squat and powerful, but they're also engineered to have less of a warp presence, which keeps them safe from chaos. They also still make use of iron kin, intelligent robots who are considered equal members of their society. The Leagues of Votan aren't ever directly stated to be involved with the old Men of Stone mythology, but they do fit quite nicely into that timeline. They're artificially constructed humans, just like Alan said, but they're still real people with a real soul, it's just dimmed to protect them against the warp. They have created kin of iron, and while both of our original sources said that the iron men turned on the stone men and wiped them out, Maybe the colonies in the galactic core were spared this. They're famously isolationist after all. And while the Leagues don't fully remember their own history either, in some of their earliest frescoes, their creators are depicted as a group of golden figures. You could totally see the Leagues of Votan as an example of the sort of thing that the Men of Stone might have been. One specific type of stone men, changed over thousands of years in the galactic core. But, just like in every other video on this subject, that would be a theory. It's very unlikely, the way Warhammer law works, that this is intended as confirmation that Kripias and Kron were right all along. It's much more likely that whoever was writing the law for the Leagues wanted to draw on something that existed in the world and add another layer to the mystery rather than simply confirming that something's true. The stories from back in 2000 are just as likely to be myth as they always were. So there everything written about the men of gold and stone, and a little bit more about the men of iron. Ancient history, or is it? Thanks for watching. 
And if you'd like to see more retrospectives of 40k lore, then there should be a little video coming up on the right. And if you'd like to support the channel, have a look in the description below where there are things like Patreons and like and subscribe and, and you know, stuff. See ya!